Okay, the, the next poem um, is, is also from my new book. And I, I was inspired by um, misreading a, a, a book. And I thought the, the book said last night in Antsville when it said something more like um, last night in Banksville or something that, that wasn't as evocative. But since, since I love insects, it, it um, made me write this poem. Last night in Antsville. Epi epigraph. I crawled my way out of the dirt, and by God, I will crawl my way back into the dirt. And I heard this in a coffee shop. I never asked to be born, was my older sister's favorite response to our mother's nagging. We were finishing our roadkill chicken dinner when mom brought up college again. Antoinette, my sister, stormed out to piss the evening away at the barrel house, as always. Her best friends, Antonia and Antigone, worked at the local venom factory, so that's where she planned to go after high school. End of story. Sobbing, mom grabbed the dirty dishes with her mandibles and smashed them against the wall. As always, I helped clean up the mess in silence. Nobody knew I was leaving this hole for tomorrow, for Hollywood, maybe forever this time. The next poem um, is the title poem of my, my new book, um, The Loneliest Whale Blues. And um, it's about an actual whale uh, with a strange voice that um, would call out and, and no other whales would, would answer. I think it's a pretty famous will. There was a documentary um, done on it last year by Leonardo DiCaprio um, called The Loneliest Whale, um, The Search for 52. F 52 referring to its uh, uh, the pitch of its voice. And I, I, I wanted to understand the will. And so I, I, I kind of, um, put myself in it. And um, I guess we, we all try to understand the world by, by trying to um, put yourself in its place. And, and there's my, my loneliest whale, if you can, you can see it in the back there. The loneliest whale blues, epigraph. All these whales can hear this guy. They're not deaf, he's just odd. For over 20 years, he has called out and gone unanswered. The loneliest whale with 52 pitch, 52 hertz pitch, a falsetto at a base conference. To be unique among the Japanese means to be alone. A subarashi freak, a grand outcast, a curious whale wandering the bluest wilderness. Maybe the whale needs space, so deliberately acts repulsive. Maybe he's wailing ancient sticks tunes or screeching out to all, konnichiwa, you sick fucks. But possibly the whale sings because of the sun. He watches her swim solitary across the long days. One day she will bring her red hot rhythm as all the great soulmates do. I'm, I'm sorry for the for the profanity. You can bleep that out. That has been bleeped out in other other um, interviews. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, this, this next poem um, goes back to my, my first book, and it was inspired um, about an, another animal um, that I read about. It was a news story from Norway, and I used to get a lot of Scandinavian news when I lived in Minnesota. And so this was my trying to understand um, something that happened there about a, a, a swan that, that killed an old lady. Song of the Angry Swan. In the faraway land of Norway lived a beautiful white swan named Oscar. He was a proud and angry swan given over to icy narcissism and sudden virulent rage. He was a mood to, to avoid. Oscar had a fine palace of sticks and decaying matter on the most desirable fjord possible. People from far and wide would come to gaze upon his proud and angry form. They always kept their distance, of course. This went on for longer than anyone could remember. 
Perhaps there were over 600 generations of Oscars and maybe Oscar was an obscure God cursed by a better known God and awaited the end of time to regain his original shape. There is precedent. But one spring morning in the terrible age of exploding airplanes, an old woman from unknown lands came upon Oscar. She came alone with nothing but the mystery of countless green summers. Oscar sat proudly upon his fine palace, still as an alabaster obelisk. She crept closer than the shadows and he was a ray of iron sunshine. And no one knows if the crone saw him. In a flash, Oscar dashed and swept her into the cold mouth of the sea. Perhaps one might imagine a nubile Lita and her supremely aroused swan, but this seemed all wrong. The people rose up against Oscar with sticks, stones, and decaying matter, and the fine palace was no more. And Oscar, the last of the ancient gods, or the last of the line of animal monsters vanished from sight. And all rem that remained was a strange lady who sang on the shores of all the fjords and sings on still. My, my first book was, was most influenced by my, my life in Minnesota. Um, so I, 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 I feel that the new book is a, a real shift away from, from, from that influence in, and more to my life, trying to make sense of my life here in, in Arizona, as well as my, my um, early life back in Hawaii. But I did get into a bunch of Nordic stuff when, when I lived in Minnesota, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, the next poem um, comes from my, my uh, first book again. And um, it's, I, I challenged myself to write a poem in the form of a press release. And um, I had fun doing that. And I wanted to write about something mundane, but make it but elevate it to something more important. It's called Peaches Resist Consumption, Tempe, Arizona. Two peaches on the kitchen table refused to ripen. While fragrant with promise and graced with the colors of the sunrise, the fruit stay unyielding to the touch for days after purchase, said the woman of the home. My husband tried biting into one, but his powerful teeth barely dented the skin. Her husband added, we are beginning to believe they are not what they seem. At present, the peaches remain silent and impenetrable. Their, si their presence renders the small apartment as immense as a great sphinx. I hate those kind of peaches. <laughs> it feels like such a betrayal. Well, it is. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> when you wait such a long time, you know, and then it was for nothing. <laughs> um, and the next one is, is uh, me trying to, I, I, I like trying to write poems in, in different forms. And this was taking the form of a bunch of horoscopes. It, it looks like horoscope writing would, would be a fun, easy thing to do, but it, it's, it's a lot more challenging than you might expect. And um, well, I, I don't know anything about, about reading star charts or anything, but uh, I, I call this one the Black Goose Horoscopes, and you'll see why. Aries, that which you seek may not be found in a book unless you are the narrator. Taurus, take the Black Goose with the one red eye and the one white eye out for pancakes and good fortune will follow. Gemini, in the absence of spice in your life, go to town decorating with confetti. Cancer, know your place is in the center of the world, which is near Phoenix. <laughs> Leo, you will receive a message from a stranger about a lost animal bearing your name. Virgo, learn how to control the weather through dance and you can save our planet. Libra, remember the Lusitania and other forgotten propaganda so you will never be tricked again. Scorpio, 
Scorpio. Choose life or choose death, but don't dally in between. Sagittarius, your mate is made of 100 snakes and you are made of 100 doves. Capricorn, at the fork in the road, choose the most desolate way. Easy street and tequila will not heal you. Aquarius, which is me, be the fool on the hill and the king of snails. Pisces, the stars see you wearing a new hat and they also see pancakes in joy. <laughs> Okay, um, the next poem is in, is in high bun format again, and it's about something that we all do but don't want to admit to ever doing, which is um, snooping on people on the internet, Googling old friends or old boyfriends and, and, and the sort, because uh, I think it's, it's very human to want to know about people in the past or people, you keep old enemies and you hope that, that um, they got their, they're just desserts. Karma via the internet. I'm getting nostalgic in a negative way and the internet helps. Any online post or picture might unleash bad memories, a red dress, a spilt beer, an ad for online education. And suddenly my fingers come alive Googling a long lost nemesis. I'm hell bent on finding out if somebody got they're just comeuppances. Sometimes I'll discover they have picture perfect lives of conventional success with excesses of celebrations, accolades and upscale bells and whistles, buttons and bows. I can only imagine their giant closets overflowing with fly covered skeletons. But last night I hit the mother load of poetic justice. My searches revealed one guy lost an eye, possibly to a shark. And the snakiest person I ever knew was dead, dead. But thus, thus far exceeding my, my revenge fantasy expectations, I forgive them all. And I felt stronger than hell because karma eats away at trauma if you let it. And the, the haiku is, my mother warned me to hold grudges is like stabbing at ghosts in your own heart. Um, the next poem <clears throat> is, is um, a, an ekphrastic poem that, that is, I found a picture of Abraham Lincoln's house slippers on the internet. And if you, if you Google Abraham Lincoln's house slippers, you'll, you'll find what I'm, what I'm talking about. And it, it, it's, it so enchanted me that I wanted to find some way to connect with them and, well, and connect with Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's house slippers. I underestimated you, Abraham Lincoln. You are more than your beard, your black stovepipe hat, your logs, your Gettysburg Address, your Emancipation Proclamation, your Flagstaff physique, your decision to hang 38 starving Dakota men, your thighs as perfect as any human beings could be, your death by a shot to the head by William, by John Wilkes Booth. I thought I knew you until I saw your house slippers. I, I would have imagined black silk ones to match your favorite hat. Of course, you probably didn't wear that hat while you padded around the house in your pajamas. So having tan slippers embroidered with apricot flowers and white and pink goat heads with violet eyes makes sense. Unlikely details reveal the most about a person. The ragged state of your private footwear speaks to me, reminding me of my father. Dad kept his shelves of stylish shoes, spick and span, yet his house slippers were basic black, stuffed gray over the decades. They outlived him, just like your slippers. But suppose all our beloved shoes await reunion with their owners. Perhaps at death's door, Mr. President, the ghosts of your faithful old shoes, old shoes shuffled over to greet you. Only you were a kid again, 
like the two goats ready to bury you across the last divide. Let's see, second to last poem, <clears throat> it's called Snail. It's another, <clears throat> excuse me, high one. Oops. It's very dry here. <clears throat> and it, it's about the Japanese art form of kintsugi, and which I think most people are familiar with, but I'll, I'll talk about it. And I, I've seen a lot of um, poets write about, about kintsugi, which, which is really interesting to me. Um, but I'm the only person to include a snail in my discussion of it. So here it is, the, the, the poem's called Snail. There is a humble snail inside my chest, thrift store white porcelain shell. Eye stalks glancing the clouds like kite strings. It learns slowly, but it never forgets. I used to smoke to force my snail into its shell so it couldn't see, couldn't feel. Now I, heart, now I can make my heart hide in its shell without cigarettes. But cynicism is brittle armor. Life will still crush you and march on. And since nothing in nature is ever wasted, other snails will eat you and crawl on. But more often than not, life has put me back together, piece by piece. We can all be brutal boots, but also helping hands. It also helps to know about kintsugi, the Japanese art form meaning to repair with gold. When a ceramic dish shatters, a craftsperson rejoins its shards using lacquer dusted with gold or silver. These lustrous scars render the pottery even more beautiful than it, when it was perfectly intact. And the haiku is, the greatest treasure could be one's humility, a fractured heart healed. And I want to, to end this part of the reading with a poem from my, my first book, but I feel it's, it's relevant right now. Um, when I first wrote, wrote the poem, um, it was the end of the Iraq war. And um, uh, at, at, at the, the end of a, a, another brutal um, a presidential election, it, it feels like these uh, presidential election seasons get worse and worse as, as, as we get go on. And it's made um, us feel very burnt out by politics and, and the world situation. But, um, and the pandemic isn't helping either. I think a lot of us feel very tired and um, uh, just, just feeling very cynical about things. And um, I feel that the, the solution to that is to to regain your innocence in some way, try to find the person that you were, reconnect to that person before um, you, everything seemed to go to hell. Mm -hmm. And I think it's possible, innocence. When life knifes you in the soul to heal your innocence, go back to your roots. When your homeland lies broken by embittering winds, go back to your roots where tales shimmer with heroes who might in the light of day play as squirrels or kelp dressed girls at the sea at night. They are mirrors who always remember our original beautiful faces of fur, feathers, or leaves. When time's sun burns you down, drink deep from story's sweet ground and go back to your roots. And that's it for now. Thank you for listening. So you had the eight of us here clapping out loud, and then you had everyone on their individual computers clapping silently. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I could see, thank you. Um, we have uh, students who have thought up the questions that they would like to have answered. Let me see if any of them has the nerve today to ask one of their own out loud. Anyone? All right, Gabby. Okay, so my question is, 
use uh, the word monsters throughout the, your news book, and I'm more. I, I, I beg your pardon, what, what word? Monster. monster. Oh, monster. Okay. So I'm wondering what it devises to you and what's your definition of the word monster? Oh, man. <laughs> that's that's huge. <laughs> well, for for me, um, because my my I I, I come from an in a, a background where I was steeped in a lot of, of Japanese culture when I was when I was a kid in Hawaii, I I see monsters in two ways. Particularly, um, there's a, there's a the kaiju, the the monsters that appeared in in a lot of children's programs in um, in, in uh, Hawaii showed a lot of of Japanese TV shows, and so it, it all all the kids I grew up with grew up with with that kind of um, um, influence, thinking of monsters as as being campy and and fun, um, mutants, um, um, you know. Uh, my friends of Godzilla. And at the same time, since I am very Western and um, I, my, my background is you know, uh, in English, I'm um, having a PhD in English. I, I'm, I'm thoroughly grounded in the Western literary tradition and, and the monsters there. And my husband's got his PhD in philosophy. So he's very Western, even though he teaches in American Indian studies right now. But um, so anyway, um, our ideas um, are, are are grounded in 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 in, in that. Um, for the, I guess the other side of monsters, um, I think of uh, in the Western tradition, monsters like like Dracula and Frankenstein, and um, um, those those sort of thing people, um, as well as as Hitler. Um, Putin, <laughs> um, Charles Manson. We 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 generally call those people monsters. It's very negative, and um, there's also a sense of people we don't understand, um, who are, um, we project things on. Um, we we call them monsters, but it's just because we don't understand them. So, kind of strange people of the world, you know, are. Uh, look very shadowy and scary to to mainstream culture, and um, I, I've always felt very close to monsters in that way because I've, I, I, being an Aquarius, I can't help but being like the weirdest person in the room all my life, <laughs> and so I've, I've always felt misunderstood. And being um, somebody from a pretty uh, unusual background. I, I know I'm 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 thinking differently from many people. Being an extreme introvert, um, um, I I'm I'm not very open um, with my emotions and 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 many thoughts. Um, so people are, are are likely to to see me as as something a a, a little scary, and so um, that's what's going on with monsters. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience want to shoot out one of your questions? Kayla. Uh, how does your own personal experience affect your writing and stylistic choices? Should I repeat that? Yeah. How does your own, tell me if I get this right. How does your own personal experience affect your writing and stylistic choices? Writing and your stylistic choices. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> My own personal experience. I, 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 I'm not sure how to answer that, but I'm, I know when I started out writing, I was uh, very much influenced by um, the poets, uh, James Tate, and Russell Edson, I don't know if, if if you're familiar with them, but but just excellent um, um, prose poets and and writers with a with a really good sense of humor, and I I felt that they 
they were very sympathetic to to people and and animals like my myself, and I, I found them kindred spirits. So I I did uh, uh, allow myself to be influenced um, in in my writing style. Um, then, and I think it it particularly shows in my first book. But moving away from from that, and and um, I guess becoming older, I found myself um, becoming more interested in uh, in uh, a high bone, a, the a, a, a traditional Japanese form, and uh, writing more haiku as well. And um, I don't, I'm not sure if I've, I've, I, I think I used to be more experimental because I, I, I felt like I was, I was a younger person, <laughs> and and now I'm, I feel like I'm, I've, because I'm getting older and I, I'm developing. Um, my own, um, my own style. Mm. So that, that I guess I guess age has been a, has has played a, a, a big difference in the way I'm I'm writing now, as well as change of location from from Minnesota to Arizona. How long were you in Minnesota? Um, I guess a, about nine years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, a chunk of time that could have an influence for sure. Yeah, and being in one of the coldest states in the in the U.S. and to moving to the hottest state in the U.S. it's it it it's given me a lot to think about. <laughs> from from uh, as a, a colleague recently posted the uh, NPR uh, appearance of. Um, Marlon James on uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And he w had been in Minnesota and he said from, from 90 degrees to minus 90. He had, <laughs> he had, he had moved the other way, he, you know. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, the, the people are, are wonderful, but I, I, I don't know if I wanna go back there. I still remember standing at the bus stop, you know, and, and it was minus, fi minus, um, minus 15 degrees. And I, I mean, you, you just bear it kind of like the way you bear the heat around here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions from the audience here live or uh, online, you can ask out loud or you can put it in the chat area. You've got a question. Kayla, you got another one? Uh, many of the poems, even those that feel light and happy, still have dark or deep tones and language. Was this intentional? Should I repeat that one? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's very echoey from here. Oh, yeah, it is. it's a kind of cavernous room, but it's the only one with a big screen so that we can see you loud and clear. Um, many of the poems, even when they uh, have a, a light tone or a cheerful quality, still have a dark or a deep, intense kind of quality. Um, was this intentional? You know, can you, and I want to tack on, you know, is it, is it hard to have one without the other? Just curious. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have. I really am into balance, and um, I, I, I feel that opposites should be um, complementary, um, and and they 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 um, fulfill each other. And so you need to have both elements, or it's just. Well, for me, it for me it doesn't work, you know. I and it, it is it is it really poetry if if a poem's just plain funny, you know? I, I I don't I don't think so. Then it's just it's just a stand up routine, and if it's just too depressing, it's like, do people do people want to hear it? I mean, I'm not sure if I want to hear a, go through a, a a poem that's just very very dark, and very sad. And reach the end and feel just as dark and sad, you know, or feel worse than when I I started the poem, and so I feel that there's there's a need for that that lightness, you know, um, everywhere, and as, as well as that, and lightness needs to be um, there needs to be gravity, otherwise it's 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 just nothing. So, but th thanks for noticing that. Yeah, I had been wondering how um, 
like I, I found this kind of puckish quality in a lot of your poems where just it'll be a serious subject, but there'll be a, a very light wording or a, or a little flippant twist, you know, and uh, that that humor there was something I got more and more curious about as I experienced your work. Um, at many years ago, Mary Rufel read here and um, oh. someone, someone said, how do you make your work so funny? And she said, you know, I never knew I was funny at all ever in my life until I did a poetry reading and people started laughing and <laughs> she had no idea uh, that other people would experience what she was saying as funny to her. It was just the way I talk. You know. <laughs> uh, so she learned something there. Yeah. Um, is there a question in the chat? Let me check. I see something. What is your process for writing? And is there a best time of day? Um, I'm sorry, I have to repeat that. It's all echoing okay. again. Um, what is your process for writing? And what is the best time of day? <laughs> Um, my process. Well, I guess it, the well the the best time of day for me is the morning, and as soon as I wake up, I guess it's it's always been that way. I I like to. I think poetry is close to dream state. I mean, it it there's just a a, a, a small dividing line, and it's when your brain is is fluid and open to a lot, a lot more than your waking state. It's the easiest time to, to write poetry for me. But um, in terms of, yeah, um, like the, what sparks a, a poem at first is, like I'm, I'm just open to in, inspiration at any time of the day, any time, any time I'm walking around. I'll, I'll see something like um, misreading a sign. I'm always misreading things and then they wind up being poems. And um, yeah, overhearing something that, that, that grabs my attention. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll write everything down or, or I'll put it in my, my cell phone notes and, um, and, and make sure to, to have them when, when I wake up in the morning and see if, if I can turn them into something. Mm. Yeah. Right. Other questions? We have, we have a reticent audience. They have a long list of things they want to know, but let me, let me borrow somebody. We actually had two people ask um, where you get your inspiration. And I think one of the things we talked about was, was how varied your subject matter is. Um, so I think, yeah, we'd like to hear you talk a little bit. And you kind of have some already, but where, where do the ideas come from? Yeah, since, since I, I, I try to record everything that, that interests me uh, walking around and online, um, uh, it, and I, 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 I do um, have a great interest in, in um, animals, um, as, as you can probably tell, and particularly insects and, and, um, and, and their lives. So it, 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 I think it, it, it is a little strange um, how I'm I'm in, inspired. I, I try to keep my mind open to everything, I'm, and I I don't ever feel like I, I must talk about my myself and my identity. Um, I, I think it's there, it, um, ground grounding in who I am, but I don't I'm, I don't feel ever limited by that by my, my, my background. And so I think it, it opens me up to a lot of different kinds of inspiration and being sympathetic to um, different, different uh, life forms, different ideas, different people. Yeah. I don't know if that, that answers your question. I'm inspired by anything, anything I come across, I, I feel like it's, 
it's fair game to to talk about some more and try to understand by just putting putting myself in whatever's shoes and, and running with it. Yeah, that one of the things that people definitely noticed was the um, presence of animals in the poems, and that was something they wanted to ask about in addition to the monsters. Um, is what is this, you know, deep and wide ranging uh, interest in animals and the inclusion of them in your work? You know, do you, do you have a theory about that or is it just like, oh, I don't know, it just happens? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd have to say it, it may have, well, I've, al I've always loved animals. I'm pretty animal identified. And um, what, what do I mean by that? Well, in um, Asian astrology, I guess people call it Chinese astrology, everybody is assigned an, an animal at birth, I mean, according to um, when you're born. And um, so I'm, I'm very aware of being a rabbit. I was born in the year of the rabbit. And it's, now it's come to the point where I don't see people as real until I find out what animal they are in, 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 in the Asian um, astrological um, scheme of things. I just have a hard time. Um, and I, I don't, I feel like I, I don't really understand you. I just see your human mask, but I wanna see the animal inside you. And I think that's more real, that's more real for me. So I guess I, I just have that, that, that sympathy for, for, for animals and feeling that, that people are are just um, are, are are animals with masks on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we have some people who have to leave because they're going to work or they have a class at two. They've got to grab a sandwich before. Um, but here's a wonderful question somebody asked: uh, What aspect of your writing are you most proud of? I think that's a hard question, especially for introverts. <laughs> wow. Wow, yeah, that, that is very difficult. I guess I'm most proud of when I've written things that were, were very difficult for me to write, but I felt like it's very important Important that I, I articulate it and, and share it with the world. And particularly like my, my poem on um, the Battle of Okinawa. It's like, I, I, didn't, I didn't wanna write that. And I, I don't like writing personal poems. I don't wanna talk about my experience um, because I'm, I'm very private and introverted. So when I force myself to share experiences, share things that really mean a, a lot to me, um, things that have happened to me, um, I feel pr I feel proud that I I did that because it it isn't easy. Yeah, I I completely understand what you know, what you're saying there, um, but and so thank you for sharing that particularly personal and therefore even more difficult poem. Uh, I think it's a a good time for us to all remember um, all the all the violence of history before we go catapulting it into more to use that wisdom to pull back. Yeah. Um, one person in the chat has asked, "When is your new book coming out?" And it should be uh, available in about six weeks at Small Press Distribution or you can order it through the WordWorks website. Um, I urge everyone always to get books from other sources besides Amazon, but if you like Amazon, they will get their copies from small press distribution through a long and convoluted sneaky chain. Um, so it will be available there too, but that will take a little longer as they figure out our, our diabolical plan. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't wait to hold this book in my hands, Sharon, and, and have it on my shelves forever. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's really, it's been great to see you in person. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to be able to see and, and hear people. And um, <laughs> thank, thank as, you. As well as you could hear through the masks and the, <laughs> the yeah. echoing room. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 yeah. I'm, Appreciate not having to wear a mask and talk to you all. <laughs> it, it's one of the great things about Zoom. And the other thing that students have commented on, um, especially if they're watching from home, is that they get to be absolutely face to face, one on one with an author. And uh, that that is a real gift, you know, to have that that time pretty much nose to nose, you know, when you're on your laptop. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be able to do that and, and share my, my study with people as well, which is something I couldn't do before. Is this is where I, I write my poems. When I, I used to write my poems in a coffee shop, but since the pandemic, I've, been, I've had to write um, here for the most part. And so, yeah. Like, like, here's where the, a lot of inspiration comes together. Here's where it happens. And we got to meet your whale. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk to you soon one way or another. And thank you very much for joining us today, Sharon. Thank you. All Have right. A nice day. Yeah, you, everybody else too. I'm going to sign off now. <laughs>